In a previous unit, we discussed the concept of algorithms in a general way, along with computation. And in this particular lesson, we will cover the topic of algorithms more deeply. So as mentioned in the past, you should try to occasionally add to your course various news stories, such as uh, those from ACM Tech News that might be related. So these are some news stories that I used in the past related to algorithms and th that I've, I've taken and pulled out from past year's lectures on algorithms. It just happened that very week that I was introducing some of these or, or preparing earlier in the semester for that, I collected some of these stories about how algorithms are having impact. So the, the typical stories from the news are all about capturing the ideas of impact as a big idea in computing. So just a review, we, we saw this slide earlier when we were discussing computation and the Turing machine. Computation is just a way to calculate or compute things that involves a process that follows a well-defined model that's expressed in an algorithm. And an algorithm can be defined very generally as a set of rules or formula for solving a specific problem. And algorithms can be expressed in various ways, English or Java. Some examples we discussed even in the past are recipes. A really nice unplugged activity is to ask your class how to tie your shoes and follow their directions or uh, doing a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is a very popular one, computing taxes and so on. So computer scientists study algorithms from the perspective of complexity and trying to understand performance of those algorithms and the best case, worst case scenarios of how those algorithms might perform. A very popular algorithm to study with your class would be sorting. So it's a great common algorithm to discuss and something that students can easily understand already. So the, the more formal definition is that you're given an un unordered set of values and you have to place them in a specific order as defined by a unique operator. By a unique operator, what I mean here would be, for example, the, the greater than or less than operator. You could have an operator where you're comparing people's height. It could be shorter than or, or taller than or older than or younger than. So any kind of operator that you can do a comparison of two values and you can then assess the relative ordering of those two values. So with sorting, there's, there are CS Unplugged activities that work really well, and we actually did some of these in our face-to-face -face professional development that we hope to share with you sometime. So the idea would be to give out binary numbers to your class and then ask a few volunteers to come forward, and they can then convert that to decimal, and then we ask the students to sort themselves. So maybe they'd have a post-it note and they would convert the binary number to decimal and write the decimal on the post-it note. And then, you know, six or eight students up front, we would ask them to sort themselves based upon what number they have, then ask them to reflect upon what it is that they did in order to sort. So from that, we then ask them to think about if they had to invent a machine that would sort, for example, four numbers. So any four numbers in any kind of sequence and we put those into the machine, and then a kind of a black box representation of the machine. What's the output? And the output would always be sorted values according to some criteria. So we can draw on the screen a machine that has an ability mechanically to sort four numbers, and ask them how we would create such a machine. Here on this slide is a sorting network. So this sorting ne network actually will sort six values. And you can see how complex this can become and when I do this exercise with middle school or even elementary school children, we'll go outside and, and draw with chalk on the playground a sorting network and then do the exercise with binary numbers and ask the students to sort themselves. This may not work very well with your high school students, you know, sending them out on a playground to sort themselves. That may not be age appropriate, it may be for younger students. But if you do this on the board, you can still help them to see how this, this kind of idea doesn't scale. If we were to do this mechanically, with a bunch of switches, this thing soon gets out of hand. So from four to six, we have a lot more of these circles. So each time we're, we're doing these mechanical sorting networks, we are doing comparisons among two values and then processing the result and sending each of the two results to another comparator. So being able to do that in a, in, in a kind of mechanical approach doesn't scale. So we discussed then in that context, what, what should we do then? So the concept of sorting algorithms helps to uh, address this issue of scale for very large sizes of input. Doing a sorting network for a thousand numbers would be really hard. It would take you know, a lifetime to probably describe a sorting network for that on your board. So instead we have algorithms that are more general that have been developed to help 
deal with the problem of size. So there's all kinds of categories of sorting algorithms. In fact, a really famous book by a famous computer scientist, Donald Knuth, actually is nothing but a series of descriptions of algorithms for searching and sorting. And it goes on for several hundreds of pages in deep mathematical context. So it's a very important topic and one that's been investigated deeply. And we'll only look at one small sort in this case, the selection sort, and just discuss that in terms of algorithms. So an example context would imagine we have a game of some sort and we would like to sort the highest scores from highest to lowest. And we may have a parallel array like we saw before when we talked about lists. So a parallel set of lists would be two lists where the indices of, of those lists would be corresponding. So to introduce the idea of a selection sort, a selection sort sorts information in different stages or passes. So each pass in a selection sort will find the next smallest or next largest element. And at the end of the pass, we will swap out that value and put it in the proper place that it belongs. And then we continue to repeat this process until we reach the end of the list. So on this slide, you can see there are five numbers, 35, 65, 30, 60, and 20. And initially on the first row, they are unsorted. And our goal is to find a way or to describe an algorithm that will sort these numbers. And what we do with the selection sort, in the very first row, we're fixed on the number 35 because that's the very first index into this list. So what I want to do is find, instead of 35, I want to find for that first index, what's the smallest value in this list? And you and I can look and obviously see that that's the number of 20. But how will we describe that algorithmically so that a computer could process this? So the idea with a selection sort is we continue to examine every element beginning at index 1 with 35. And we, we go and compare, for example, we compare 35 to 65. So 35 is still smaller. And then we compare 35 to 30. We find out then that 30 is smaller than 35. So 30 then becomes a new thing we're looking at. And then 30 is less than 60. But then we go to the final one with 20. 30 and 20. Well, 20 is less than 30, so 20 becomes the value that I really want to swap in this first row. So I remember where I started, index location 1 with 35, and I swap out 35 and 20. So if you look at the second row, you can see that that indeed happened. So 20 is in its proper place. That's the first sorted number. That's the lowest number in that list. And then we have 65 on, and then 35 is now at the end. So in the second row, we start with the second item, which is 65. And we want to now find in the second row, what's the second smallest number? So if I then start an index moving forward from 65, the next smallest number that I can determine is 30. So when I go through the second phase, I found the second number, smallest number, which is 30. Likewise, when I'm on the third row, after I've done the third pass, I find the third smallest number, which is 35. And eventually I end up with all of the rows being sorted and I have the smallest number from 20 up to the largest number of 65. So that's a way to describe a sorting process algorithmically, not based on a sorting network. And I can do this algorithm for an arbitrarily large number of inputs. So give, give a million, if you give me a million um, elements in a list, I can still sort that, where a million nodes in a sorting network would be impossible to build. So here's the selection sort that we showed as an example actually described in pseudocode. So for every item in the list, from the first element to the end, each pass through that, we're going to set this largest index to be the current item. For example, in row one, the current item is the first, the first one. In row three, the, we started with the third item in the row. And then what we do is process every subsequent item in the rest of the list. And we're trying to find which particular item in the rest of the list should be swapped, if it's smaller or larger. And then once we find, in this case, the largest index, we're trying to, in this case, look for the largest number down to the smallest. Once we found that in a particular row, we then swap those out. So that's how you can describe the selection sort in pseudocode. Here is a selection sort described in SNAP. On this slide, you can see the implementation of selection sort in SNAP. So I'm not going to describe all the details of this. Instead, I'm going to ask you to, to work through this and, and try to struggle a little bit and convince yourself how this algorithm works in SNAP, referring back maybe to the pseudocode or to the example. Try this out, and then you can come on Piazza or the Hangouts and ask questions about this, and we can discuss this among the class. Some things to notice about 
this particular implementation in this block is that we have special variables here. For example, counter and index and largest index are different than how we've done this in the past. So this is a way in SNAP to declare what we call local variables. So these variables are only available and can be accessed within this block. They're not global to the whole program as we saw before. So this is actually a good practice. We didn't introduce this prior to this unit because we didn't want to confuse um, too many concepts at once back in Unit 3. But this is a practice you should go into and um, consider in the future of creating what are called local variables to your blocks. So struggle with this and we'll discuss this a bit more online or in the Hangouts.